the government shutdown over the border wall has amplified political divisions. John Yang looks at how all this is highlighted in this new era of divided government. Amna, the new Congress is at work, even if some of the federal government isn't. And the new members include some progressive Democrats who are calling for big changes. To break all this down, I'm joined by our Politics Monday team. That's Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report and Tamara Keith of NPR. Uh, the, the shutdown is in day 17. We're essentially where we were on right. day one. Uh, Tam, let me ask you, let me start with you. The president for two years of his administration has been saying he wants this barrier. He wants this wall on the border, but he's signed spending bills without any money for the, for the wall until now. Why is he digging in now? There are a lot of reasons why he might be digging in now. The official reason that uh, we got from Vice President Pence today is that there is a crisis along the border that didn't exist earlier, that, that it is more of a crisis, a humanitarian and security crisis. That is the administration argument. Uh, the other argument would be that the president uh, is looking at 2020. The, the re-election has begun, and this is a key, central, very important promise of his campaign that he hasn't been able to keep. And if he folded one more time and his last best chance, then what? Um, and so from the administration perspective, that's why we're here. From the Democrats' perspective, they just waged a campaign uh, where President Trump, in the midterms, went and held rallies that were all about border security and the wall. It was such a big focus. And Democrats won the House, and not by a little bit. And so they don't, th their voters are telling them, and polls are telling them, why move? Don't move on this. Don't, don't fold to the president. They, they feel like it would be a really bad uh, precedent to set at the beginning of a new term for Congress. Amy? So no one feels like they have anything to lose, yeah. right? And when you are in a process where you're not feeling any pain, you're not going to make any changes. And the only way it seems that the, the folks who are in Congress will feel the pain is their, either their constituents come to tell them or they see polling that suggests that uh, voters are blaming them. What's really different this time, too, from back when uh, we were talking about these issues in 2016 and 17 and 18, not just that the House changed control, but look at the Senate map. The Senate map in 2018, it was tilted very much in favor of Republicans. It was red state Democrats who were on the ballot. And so there was a lot of political calculation from folks like Chuck Schumer, the uh, minority leader, about protecting those vulnerable incumbents. Well, guess what? In 2020, there's only one red, red state Democrat on the ballot. There are a number of blue and purple state Republicans on the ballot. How many of them? We've already seen a number of them come out and, and say, we'd like to see this shutdown end. It's going to take a lot more than a couple of them. But they're certainly much more vulnerable than uh, Republicans are more vulnerable on this issue than they were, at least in the Senate, back in 2018. One of the senators on the ballot in 2020 is Mitch McConnell, yes. the majority leader who has been mostly absent from this. But he's mu much more worried about a primary challenge. Guess who else is on the ballot in 2020? Lindsey Graham. What is Lindsey Graham more worried about, a primary or a general election in South Carolina? I'm going to tell you it's a primary. Well, this is a, a, a sort of rude awakening or welcome for the about 100 freshman uh, <laughs> lawmakers in both the House and the Senate. Uh, although if uh, a, the casual observers may be forgiven if they think there's only one freshman. Uh, that's <laughs> Representative uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's been getting a lot of attention. She got something this weekend that some senior members have never gotten. That's a full-blown profile in 60 Minutes. Right. Let's take a listen to a little bit of what she said. What you are talking about, just big picture, is a radical agenda compared to the way politics is done right now. Well... I think that it only has ever been radicals that have changed this country. Abraham Lincoln made the radical decision to sign the, the Emancipation Proclamation. Franklin Delano Roosevelt made the radical decision to embark on establishing programs like Social Security. Do you call yourself a radical? Yeah, you know, if that's what radical means, call me a radical. Proudly embracing the title radical. Amy, what do you make of this? Um, well, there are many Republicans right now who are happy to see her embrace that title, and they want to put that mantle on every single Democrat in every single district. They'd love to run the 2020 campaign 
on that message that Democrats are, are too radical. But look, I think what we're starting to see is the beginning of a real significant generational divide within the Democratic Party. And it's not just about age. It is about their style, and it's about priorities and approach, compromise versus confrontation. She talked a lot in that interview as well about the fact that she thinks Democrats have compromised too much in the past. We hear folks like Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, also frustrated that Democrats haven't stood up and confronted more, not necessarily talking about confronting Trump himself, which is interesting, neither really talked about that, Elizabeth Warren on the trail this weekend, or Ocasio-Cortez in that interview. What they're talking about is confronting the policy agenda, more aspirational, more aggressive. Freshman talking about too much compromise. Could Speaker Pelosi, uh, Tam, be facing the same problems that Speaker Boehner and Speaker Ryan had to deal with, with the Tea Party, with these sort of uh, younger progressives, uh, the Democrats in the House, and how is this affecting uh, what she's doing both on the wall and also on calls for impeachment. Yeah, so it's not clear yet whether she really has the left version of the right. of the Tea Party, um, because you know th basically she the votes that have been taken have been basically she got what she wanted. Democrats fell in line, yeah. um, so it's not clear that she has that on her hands. Uh, but uh, seating on the wall does her no good. It does her no good with the with the Democratic base at all. And as one of the first actions, that that's why that's why we're stuck. <laughs> that's why that's why Congress and the president have have hit an impasse on this. Is is this schism between pragmatics and progressives, for lack of a of a better phrase, is this going to also shape the Democratic sure. primaries of twenty twenty? Exactly. I mean, I think that's a battle lines now being drawn. Again, you get Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, some of the folks in, in that world saying, we need to go and have a full-throated, non-apologetic, progressive agenda. We spend too much time apologizing as Democrats, they'd argue. And then you have folks over uh, on the more moderate or compromise side of the ledger, like Joe Biden, who would argue, we need to come back from the ledge. We've had four years, it will be four years of a confrontational approach. What voters want is a return to the middle, a return to compromise. If you look at polling, actually, that's been taken um, since the election, there is a generational divide among Democratic voters. Voters over 50, much more willing to compromise, even on issues that are really important to them, like immigration. Voters under 50 say, no, we want our elected officials to stick to their principles. I was going to have you tell us how this is all going to end, but we're out of time. Oh, so I'm, <laughs> next I, so time. next time, Amy, next time. Amy Walter, Tam Keith, thanks so much. You're welcome.